chapter 14. Chapter 14 is, um, well, I, let me put it this way. We're going to do something very different today in chapter 14. Um, and what we're going to do in chapter 14 is turn our attention very specifically to a certain section. Um, in specific, the garden experience. We're going to spend most of our time in the garden experience. I'm going to give you kind of a quick run through coming up to that. But the garden experience here is this is where everything hinges. Um, this is <laughs> this is one of the most significant things in history to take place is what happens in the garden experience. So as we start into chapter 14, I want to lay a couple of things in front of you. We're going to look at this from a little bit different standpoint. Jesus, I've, I've entitled this one, The Servant of Choices. And the reason I say this is every single person in chapter 14 makes a choice. Every single encounter that happens in chapter 14 is on the basis, the encounter is on the basis of somebody making a choice. And what we're going to see in the garden experience is the reasons um, very specifically um, we're going to see reasons for why people make choices. Um, we're going to delineate how people make choices. And in, the, in, in coming to this understanding, what I want you to think about is how do you make choices? What's the basis on which you make your choice? Um, Robert Browning once said this. He said, choice is life's business. And there's an old Jewish proverb that said, to every man is given the power of choice. Choice is not something to be taken lightly, but we are given choice at every turn. We live, David Fink says, we live by making choices. You make choices in the morning, something as simple as what am I going to have for breakfast? What am I going to put on? But we also make huge choices. Should I take that next job? Should I retire? What do I do with this? What do I do with that? Huge choice uh, decisions that are made. And if you think about the course of your day, you make choices every single day. So as we look into chapter 14, we're going to see that Jesus sits in the middle of all of our choices. Jesus wand uh, makes his home in the midst of our choices, and our choices have consequences. Um, so, given that, there are a number of external circumstances that can have an effect on our choices, and we're going to see that in full bloom in the garden. But as we walk into this, Jesus is now, uh, in fact, Mark, uh, Mark really uncovers for us a very limited view of what happens in the upper room, but he, he uncovers for us a pretty significant view of what happens in the garden. So the garden experience with Jesus, where you get Luke and John that give us a huge uh, retelling of the story of what happens in the upper room, Mark's upper room experience is very small because he takes us immediately to the garden where Jesus makes a decision to be the servant of all. If you look at Philippians 2, 5 through 11, this is Paul's version of what Jesus is going through in the garden. So we get this beautiful interplay of what's happening here. And I want to unfold very quickly the stories so we make sure we capture all of Mark 14. But I want to just uncover very quickly the stories of what happens coming up to the garden experience. So chapter 14, verse 1, after two days, it was the Passover. Notice where we are in history. It is a Passover. That's not um, that's not by chance, that is not coincidence, that is planned. Um, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. So the chief priests and scribes are making a decision right now not to believe Jesus, and we've seen that from their full rejection of him and the consequences of that that we saw in chapter 13. The full rejection of Jesus politically, spiritually, nationally, um, uh, socially um, and the consequences of that. So here we now see ultimately 
they are so bent on finding a way to put him to death that it that it uh, ab uh, absolutely um, clouds any other type of judgment. So being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, isn't that an interesting thing? Here's the religious leaders in contrast to Jesus. Jesus is at the house of the lepers. The religious leaders are figuring out a way to kill Jesus who's at the house of the lepers <laughs> where no one's supposed to go. Um, he sat at a table and here comes a woman with an alabaster, fl alabaster flask, very costly oil. She comes and breaks the flask and pours it over his head. She makes a decision. Her decision is to basically pay homage to Jesus. She makes a decision about who Jesus is and her actions show it. But there's a response to this. Some who were indignant among themselves said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? Thinking that pouring fragrant oil on Jesus is a waste. Worshiping Jesus is a waste. Paying homage to Jesus is a waste. For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii, given to the poor. They criticized her sharply right in front of Jesus. And notice what Jesus does. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. In essence, what she has done is she has anointed my body and prepared it for my burial. <laughs> For you, you'll have the poor with you always. Whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you will not have always. I'm not always going to be in front of you. She's done what she could. She's come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. And assuredly, I say to you, whether this gospel, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. We hold her up today, 2,000 years later. We're still talking about this woman who poured oil on Jesus' head and anointed him for burial. His prophecy came true. We are living proof of that. She makes a decision. And Jesus comes back and says, her decision was a right one. And it was a decision based on her knowing who I am. Then Judas Iscariot, verse 10, one of the 12 went to the chief priest to betray him. Now we go back to verse, um, to verse, where, where was it? To verse one. And the trickery, they're going to now use Simon, they're going to use Judas as the trickery portion of how do they capture Jesus and put him to death. So Judas goes to one of the 12, the, one of the 12 goes to the chief priest to betray him. When they heard it, they were glad, promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. One of his own, now going to betray him. And this is on the basis of what Judas, at this time, he's making a decision on the basis of something that he thinks he knows. And what he thinks he knows is, Jesus, you're doing it wrong. You could have used that oil for to make 300 denarii and go given it to the poor. You've, you've got your ministry wrong. You're doing it wrong. Therefore, I need to turn you in. Um, this, this ministry is going off its rails. So Judas is making this decision, and we're going to see him in full measure when we get to the garden. So now, verse 12, on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, isn't that an interesting interplay that Mark gives us? This, this opening that they're going to kill the Passover lamb. His disciples said to him, where do you want us to go prepare that we may eat the Passover? So now they're going to celebrate the Passover that is the foreshadowing of Jesus being the Passover lamb for us. And this is really all we get of the upper room experience in Mark. We get, go into town, you'll find a guy, the master of the house. You're going to ask him to, to give us the room. He's going to say, okay, I'll give you the room. It'll be furnished and ready. Verse 16, so his disciples went out, found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. So a little bit of that, of that omniscience in Jesus, telling them who he would find, what he would find. The guy gives him uh, they give him the room, and they go prepare for the Passover. Verse 17, in the evening he came with the twelve. When they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one who eats with us and with me will betray me. Well, we already know this. Mark now says Jesus is now unfolding for them the decision that somebody has already made. They began to be sorrowful and say to, to him one by one, Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Isn't it interesting? that each one of the disciples wondered if it was them, which kind of tells you maybe they each thought it could be them. 
and yet Judas knows it's him. But each of the disciples is sitting in the upper room with Jesus, and they're all wondering if they're the one that potentially could betray him. He moves forward. It's one of the 12 who dips with me in the dish. Now, don't, that, that was the customary thing at the table. Jesus being the host, he is passing this around, so it could have been any one of them. He doesn't single anybody out. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man to never have been born. This is, and we know this, because Judas goes out and hangs himself because of the guilt of that decision. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. We now have this and this is something we do in remembrance of him. He took the cup, gave it all to them, blesses it, gives it to them to drink and says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Don't, don't miss those last words. As a servant, I am shedding my blood for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. When they'd sung a hymn, they went out of the Mount of Olives and they go to the garden. So this is Mark's um, retelling of the upper room, just, uh, just, just the upper room uh, scenario. So now they're walking out. We've had a decision made by the woman. We've had a decision made by Judas. We've had decisions made by the disciples. And now we move out into the garden. Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written. He's now telling them, you're going to make a decision to leave me. In the midst of all of this, you're going to make the decision to leave me. And he quotes Zechariah 13. I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Uh, who will strike the shepherd? Any idea? God himself will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This is in keeping with the prophetic word of Jesus. But after I've been raised, notice verse 28, you're all gonna be scattered, I'm gonna be struck down, but then I'm gonna be raised, don't miss that. And the disciples have missed it because they're still wondering, wait a minute, we're gonna be scattered, you're gonna be struck down, we're never gonna leave you. After I've been raised, I'll go before you to Galilee. Now Peter steps in. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. I will not stumble. He's making this decision. He's planting his flag in the ground. He's saying, Jesus, though everybody else would stumble, count on me. I won't. And Jesus said to him, surely I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows, twice you will deny me three times. He comes back and he says vehemently, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. So every disciple's now on board. They've all followed Peter. They're all saying, yes, we're going to stick with you, Jesus. Even though the prophecy says they'll be scattered, and even though Jesus has said you're going to be scattered, they're saying you're wrong. God, you're wrong. The prophecy's wrong. Christ is wrong. We're not going to do this. So a lot of bravado, a lot of testosterone going on in the upper room. Just so, you, just so you're aware of what's happening here. So now we come to the garden. And what I want to do is I want to walk through the garden experience with you. Then we're going to go back and look at four specific incidences in which decisions were made and what's the, the basis for those decisions being made. And my prayer is, as we walk through these, you're going to see these, these circumstances that play into our decisions. You may find yourself in the midst of these somewhere. You may find yourself in the midst of these decisions. If you do, that's okay, but know the end result of this, and we'll, we'll get there. So, verse 32, then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. They walk into a place, Gethsemane, which means the olive press. That's the translation of Gethsemane is the olive press. Now, I've had the privilege of standing in the Garden of Gethsemane in the olive press. And I actually had the, the wonderful privilege of teaching this passage in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is, <laughs> it, it's an unbelievable experience to be standing in the Garden of Gethsemane teaching on a passage of what happens to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a 
it, yeah, it, it's, it's unlike in any experience I've ever had. But let me tell you why the name Gethsemane is so important. What they would do with the olives is they would place them in bags and they would lay heavy beams across the, uh, the top of the olive bags. So they'd stack up olive bags, they'd lay heavy beams across the top, and there would be a place, a, a basin down below to capture when they would apply pressure to the bags. So they push this beam down and apply pressure to the bags, and they do this three times. So the pressure is applied, the olive press is applied three different times, and each time that the pressure is applied to the bags, the olives do what's called sweating. So the first time they press it down, out comes a certain, the, the oil that's right on top. The oil that's right on top is the thing that was used typically for things like soaps, those types of things, some of the more mundane things of life. They do a second pressing and more oil comes out, but this time it's oil from deeper within the olive. And that's used for a different purpose. Ultimately, the purpose of the olive oil that comes out of the final pressing is the olive oil that's used uh, for, um, for actual olive oil, for cooking in, for, for consuming. So there are three times that the olive press is pressed down, and during those three times, the olives sweat. And it's been described in the past that the olive sweating looks like the olives are sweating their own blood. <laughs> now all of a sudden you get the visual image here. Jesus goes into the garden, and he's gonna go through this pressing three times. And the scriptures even tell us that when he goes into this, that he is sweating like great drops of blood. He is sweating so profusely. He is mirroring what happens to the olives. So it's a beautiful imagery that we get of this. We're in among the olives. We're in the olive grove. We're in with the olive trees. By the way, the olive tree, the olive branch was a symbol of peace. That olive branch is a symbol of peace. And Jesus is known as the Prince of peace. So the Prince of Peace is now in a place where he's going to be pressed three times, sweat like great drops of blood, and he's in among a place that is known as a branch of peace. Isn't this imagery just beautiful? So he says now to three disciples, he says all, all the disciples sit here and pray, and he takes further with him Peter, James, and John. So these are the three that have seen him transfigured. These are the three that saw him raise Jairus' daughter. And these are the three that go deeper into the garden for the garden experience. So how many times as we walk through this passage, you remember, how many times does Jesus do the same thing? Does he say to the disciples, sit here and pray, and he goes in and prays further? How many times does he do that? Just hold up your fingers if you know. Three. So three times he does exactly what happens to the olives. Three times he goes in and does this. Now watch what happens. The first time he goes in, he goes a little farther. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. He says in verse 34, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. He asks Peter, John, and, uh, Peter James, and John to sit, stay here, and watch. Keep alert. Keep on the watch. He goes a little farther in, falls on the ground, prays that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Remember, Jesus is the God-man. There is the God part of him. There's the human part of him. The human part of him right now in the garden is saying, I really don't want to have to go through this. He knows what's coming. The deity side of him knows exactly what's coming. But, but the human side of him is saying, Father, I, I really don't want to have to go through this. But then he says this. Verse 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. There's a couple of things to make note in here. First of all, the word Abba. And I want to make sure that we're really clear on this little word. It's used three times in the scripture, one time in the garden, one time in Romans, one time in Galatians. You may have heard it said that the word Abba is another phrase for the word daddy, like a little child would talk to his father. 
there is some essence of truth to that, but I want to challenge the fact that when Jesus is sitting in the garden calling out to his Abba Father, he is not calling out as a little child to his to his daddy. He is calling out to his father as someone who is deeply, intimately known by him. This is a depth of relationship calling Abba Father that is goes far beyond a little child to its to its daddy. That's a beautiful imagery in there. We can say some of that because there is a dependency in that little child. But the Abba Father is a relationship built on deep, deep, deep intimacy. And Jesus is calling out to his Abba Father. He says, all things are possible for you. There's that admittance that God, you can do anything. And if you can do anything, take this cup away from me. Take my lot in life right now away from me. Nevertheless, now comes he makes a decision here, not what I will, but what you will. I don't want to choose my will. I'm going to choose your will. That's a big statement. So he gets back up, comes and finds them. How are the disciples right now? Are they alert, watching, praying? No, they're sleeping. Now, let me just say this on behalf of the disciples. They just had a big meal in the upper room. It's cool. It's an evening stroll. They get to the garden. They're sitting in the garden. It's quiet. It's dark. And they fall asleep. But Jesus has asked them very specifically, all of them who have said, we will not deny you. We will, not, we will never walk away from you. We won't betray you. First thing that happens is they fall asleep in the garden on his, at his command to stay awake. So then he comes. He finds them sleeping. And notice who does he point to? He said to Peter, why do you think he singles out Peter? Because Peter had the most bravado. Peter's the one who's standing up there saying, Lord, I will die for you. And yet the first opportunity that Peter has to be obedient to Jesus, he falters. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Ever been there? This is Paul going back to Romans 7. I wake up in the morning and I'm convinced I'm not going to do this and I end up doing the very thing I don't want to do. A wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of sin? Well, that's exactly what Jesus is getting ready to do. So he comes to Peter and he says, Simon, are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? The one who has said this, could you not watch one hour? Could you not stay awake one hour? Then he says to all of them, watch and pray, lest you all enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He challenges them not to fall into the temptation of the flesh. The, te the temptation to not be obedient to Christ. Spirit's willing. I'm not going to do this. But the flesh is weak. Don't make your decision based on the flesh. Make your decision based on the spirit again he went away and prayed and spoke the exact same words so now he goes in and he has a second conversation with the father that he says the same thing that he said the first time when he returned he found them asleep again <laughs> a second time they're asleep for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him so he asks them again this is take two of the same scenario then he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? So now this has happened three times. Now he comes and he says to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The time has come. The hour is here. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a minute because we know Jesus made his request of the Father three times. We know the disciples fell asleep three times. We know that Jesus singles out Peter because specifically Peter was the one who was so bold to say, I will never, basically, I'll never walk away from you. The temptation that they fall into is exactly what he warned them about. Don't fall into the temptation of the flesh. But we look at verse 41, 
And I want to ask you this question in verse 41, who is in control? He came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Who's in charge here? Who has taken complete control of this situation and is allowing it now to unfold? Jesus is voluntarily saying, this would have been an easy thing to do to say, look, it's getting ready to happen. Let's run for the hills. We don't have to be arrested. But no, he says, arise. My betrayer is at hand. This is going to happen. Jesus is in complete control right now. Absolute, make no mistake about it. This is Jesus in complete control, allowing himself to be arrested, taken to trial, crucified on your, your behalf and my behalf. Verse 43, immediately, there's Mark's immediately again, while he was still speaking. So he knows it's coming. He's still speaking in Judas. And notice Judas is going to be described two different ways here. Judas, one of the 12. So here he is, one of the 12. With a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Verse 44, now he's described as Jesus' betrayer. Had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him and lead him away safely. There's a couple of things to keep in mind here. The first thing is Judas is described as one of the 12. There's still an opportunity for Judas not to do this. And we know from other gospels that Jesus actually places in front of him the opportunity to not betray him. He puts it in front of him one more time. Judas, you sure you want to betray me? And are you sure you want to betray me with a kiss? He gives him the opportunity one last time. But the second thing that I find really fascinating, have the disciples over the course of three years ever shown themselves to be soldiers? Have they ever shown themselves to be masters of fighting, masters of weapons? These are fishermen, tax collectors. These are, uh, these, these are not seasoned, hardened soldiers. And yet look how Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace in the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of peace, look at how he is taken a great multitude with swords and clubs. Swords and clubs. They're coming to capture him. And they're coming to capture him. Are they in broad daylight? Or are they in the dark of night? So think of the irony here. The Prince of Peace being taken by violence and the light of the world being taken in the dark of night. Mark just lays out such a beautiful story for us here. And Judas, to make matters even more significant, comes to them and says, the one that I kiss. And remember, we have been given the charge to greet one another with a holy kiss. It's meant to be something that connects us together. Here, he says, the one that I kiss, he's the one. Take him away. The one that I betray with this intimate gesture of connection, he's the one that you're going to take. Really important to see all that's being set up here. Verse 45, as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to Jesus and he said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, teacher, teacher, notice how Judas does not describe him. Son of God, Son of God, Lord, Lord, he does not describe him as who he actually is, though among the disciples, Peter's already made his proclamation. Jesus has already said, this is what the Son of God's going to do. But Judas still calls him Rabbi, Rabbi, and kisses him on the cheek. Verse 46, they lay their hands on him and take him. 47, one of those who stood by drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. We know that from another passage to be Peter. Jesus says in verse 48, have you come out against a robber, uh, come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? Have you come out thinking that I am like a criminal, which is exactly why they crucify him as a criminal? I was daily with you 
in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures have to be fulfilled. This is in keeping with the scriptures. Jesus said, I was in, I was in broad daylight with you every day. You could have taken me at any time, but you have to come out, treat me like a criminal, swords and clubs, dark of night. You could have taken me at any time. And then notice verse 50. Do not forget verse 50. Then they all forsook him and fled. There's the scripture being fulfilled. Zechariah 13. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. They all take to the hills. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to head back over this story. We'll conclude the rest of it here in just a minute, but I want to head back over the story and I want you to see now that the scene, the garden scene in the book of Mark is firmly implanted in your mind, I want to walk back through and show you the four different groups of people who make decisions and the basis of their decisions. And I want to ask you the question, what do you base your decisions on? Let's look at the first one. Go back to verse 38. Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed, verse 33. He goes in with them three different times. He takes them further in, and three different times, Jesus walks in, and the same situation happens. Three different times. And Jesus warns them all three times, do not fall into the temptation of the flesh. Don't fall into the temptation of the flesh. The disciples make a choice. Their choice three different times is to fall asleep. Their choice three different times in verse 34, 38, and 40, the request is made, watch and pray, watch and pray, stay awake, stay alert, watch and pray. And as a matter of fact, it's even made this way. Can you not stay awake just one hour? Three times they make this choice in verse 37, 40, and 41, three times they make the choice to fall asleep. So let me ask you something. Have they been, have they made their choice based on the spirit or have they made their choice based on the temptation of the flesh? Temptation of the flesh. They have given themselves over to the temptation of the flesh. Now let's be honest, we're all human. The flesh gets control of us. We know this from Romans chapter 7 and how Paul takes us from the sin nature to the flesh, but he gives us the answer. The answer is the Holy Spirit who indwells us. But here what we get is a decision is made, and I want, to add you, I want you to ask yourself the question, when a decision is made in your life, do you make a decision based on the Spirit or do you make a decision based on the flesh? When you make a decision. We see this very specifically, and we're going to see Peter again in just a minute in verses 66 through 72, again make the choice three times for the flesh. He's going to make the choice when a small servant girl comes up to him and says, hey, you're one of them. And he says, no, I wasn't. And another servant girl comes up and says, you were with him. No, I wasn't. And a third time he's it's brought forward. You were one of those with the Galilean. You're one of Jesus' disciples. I don't know him. And the rooster crows. Peter, who has all this bravado in the world, now two separate times in, in three decisions, now chooses for the flesh. I, I really do believe when we get to chapter 21, uh, when you get to chapter 21 in the, in the book of John, this is where Jesus now visits Peter and says to him over and over three separate times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? It is to make up for the three times each in the garden and now after the fact where Peter chooses for the flesh. The decision and the question is, when you have a choice to make, what's your priority? Is your priority the flesh? Or is your priority the Father? Is your priority to follow Jesus? Or is your priority to follow the flesh? 
You don't have to answer that. Just be thinking about it. Because in, in essence, it's always going to be a matter of choice. Whom do you choose? So the second one comes up. We see this in Judas, verse 45. His betrayer comes, whomever I kiss, verse 44. He's the one, seize him, take him away. As soon as he had come up, immediately he went to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. So here is a second reason in which we make decisions, and it's based on fact. Are you focusing on the facts instead of other things? What did Judas up to this point know of Jesus? The fact is, in his view, he only saw Jesus as a teacher. That was the fact. He never saw Jesus as the Son of God. And even here, when he betrays him, what does he call him? Teacher, teacher. For Judas, it is the fact. He saw the handwriting on the wall. He saw the end was near. He saw that this is just a teacher, nothing more. He's never been more to Judas than just the rabbi. And when he weighed the facts, this is why he made his decision. If he, if he had known, if the fact had proven to him that Jesus was the Son of God, he would not have made this decision. But in Judas's mind, by virtue of just how he calls him, he is only, only a teacher. I want you to hear a quote. This is my friend Ken Geyer. He wrote this. He said, here's what Judas is thinking at the Last Supper. A plot brewed and soon thickened. Jesus would have to be killed. And once Judas got wind of the plot, his calculating mind went straight to the bottom line. If they killed Jesus, then certainly we, the 12, will be next on their list. Judas is sitting here saying to himself, the fact is he knows that the religious leaders are going after Jesus. And if they're going to go after Jesus, they're going to come after me. He didn't look at his shift of loyalties as a betrayal. If Jesus was determined to dig his own grave, Judas thought, well, I'll just help him with the shovel. That's all. Merely a practical matter of hurrying along the inevitable and looking out for himself. Was there dishonor in jumping from a sinking ship? And the 30 pieces of silver? Well, that was just a life preserver, a little something to keep him afloat until he could find a place to dry off somewhere, preferably a warm, comfortable place in the religious hierarchy. Maybe he could have been the treasurer. Judas, never seeing the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, only seeing Jesus as a teacher, recognizing in his mind the fact that this thing is going down, this ship is going down, makes a decision. And his decision is to betray Jesus. When we're making our choices, do we only look at the fact? Do we make a decision based on the facts or based on the Father? There is a third choice that's going on, starting in verse three, 43. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. This is mob rule. I call this the popular choice. And friends, today, this is in full bloom, the popular choice. This is the multitude. This is mob rule. The multitude gets whipped up into a frenzy. They go after it and nothing, no choice makes sense when mob rule is in play. They're sent by the religious leaders, the religious leaders who are seeking only to kill him. The mob mentality is it. They're heavily armed at night. Why in the world are they heavily armed at night? Because they've been whipped into a frenzy. They've been sent. Now, if you don't think that this kind of decision making is in play, do we talk a little bit about the political landscape today? Mob rule. Should we talk a little bit about things like family pressure, peer pressure, teen pressure, the way decisions are made when pressure is applied? Can we talk today about what happens in the world and why we make the decisions we make? This one, following the popular choice, asks this question. Does popular thinking sway my decisions. Do I follow the crowd or do I follow Christ? 
This made no sense. For a mob to come get Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the light of the world, with swords and clubs in the darkness of night. This is, this is the popular choice. This is mob rule. And I'll ask again, does popular thinking sway my decisions? Is that how I make my decisions? Do I follow the crowd or do I follow Christ? Now we come to the final one. <laughs> And friends, this gets very emotional. Um, this goes very, very deep. Verse 36, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Romans 5, 8 says this, while we were still sinners, Christ chose me. While you were an enemy of Jesus, he chose you. He made a choice in the garden based on the will of the Father and based on his love for you. Isaiah 53.10 says God's greatest joy. Now get this, this is really strange the, the way that, that the prophet Isaiah puts this, but God's greatest joy was putting Jesus on the cross because it meant you would be his. His greatest joy was that you would be his through the work of his son. Mark 14, 36 says, Jesus chose for the Father, and in doing so, he chose you. This is what I call the perfect choice. And I'm just here to tell you something. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in this verse, verse 36, you need to star this one, underline it, highlight it, because in this conversation between Jesus and the Father, between the Son of God and God himself, in this conversation, Jesus makes a choice. And his choice is to choose to go to the cross for you. I'll say it again, one of the most significant things in my entire life is standing in the middle of the Garden of Gethsemane and reading. reading this verse to stand among olive trees that they say were saplings when Jesus walked the garden to stand on the garden of Gethsemane and look across the Kidron Valley to the east gate to know this is where Jesus is going to come back to stand and look and be in the midst of the place where Jesus three times said not my will but yours three times chose to go to the cross for me. This is the most significant passage I think I can, I can find in all of Scripture. Because this is the point in which Jesus made his decision. And his decision was to follow the will of the Father because he loved me. Because he loved you. John 15, 16, we read this in our uh, Book of Love series. He said, I have chosen you. You did not choose me, I chose you, and I have called you friends. One of the most intimate things in the Jewish culture you could be called. In John 21, 15 through 18, we see, and we'll, we'll find this out, if you read that passage, this is the passage where Jesus comes back to Peter. And what we find is that he pursues us. He not only chose us, but he pursues us and he comes back to Peter three separate times and gives him the opportunity, forgives him three separate times for his lack of choice for Jesus. And I want to quote to you Joshua 24, 15, where Joshua says, Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And by the way, friends, that is a choice. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus made a choice. And he chose the will of the Father and to go to the cross for you. Now let me put the exclamation point to this. If that wasn't enough of an exclamation point, look at verse 62. They take him away 
everybody leaves. All scripture is, is done. He's taken before the chief priests. They can't figure out how to, uh, they, they can't get their testimony straight. For many bore false witness, verse 56, against him, but their testimonies didn't agree. Some rose up, bore false, false witness against him, saying, we heard him say that I'll destroy this temple made with hands, build in three days, I'll build another one without hands. They couldn't get their testimony straight. And the high priest looks at Jesus in verse 60 and says, do you have nothing to say? The, what is it about these men? They testify against you. He kept silent. And then he's asked this question. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus puts the exclamation point to his decision in the garden. And Jesus quotes Daniel. And he says, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus makes the choice. He could have easily have stayed silent and they would not have been able to convict him. He goes before Pilate three times. He's declared innocent before Pilate. He goes before Herod. He's declared innocent in six trials, three of them religious trials that were held against the laws of Judaism. He's declared innocent. Three civil trials. He's declared innocent. And yet he goes to the cross because on his own, he testifies on his behalf. He makes a choice to tell them exactly who he is. He's already made the choice for you and me in the garden. Now he comes to the trial and they ask him the question, are you the son of, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And he says, I am. And he quotes a messianic prophecy from Daniel. You will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. They say it's blasphemy. They start to beat him. They start to hit him. They continue to push him. And now we get the Peter expression and Peter in the garden going in verse 66. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. She saw Peter warming himself, said, you are with Jesus of Nazareth. Now notice this is a servant girl, but notice it's a servant girl of the high priest. He denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. The rooster crowed. Servant girl saw him again, began to say to those who stood by, he's one of them. He denied it again. And again, another stood by him and said, surely you are one. You're one of them. You're a Galilean. Your speech shows it. He began to curse and swear, I don't know this man of whom you speak. The second time the rooster crowed, Peter called to mind, uh, then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. We're left with the incredible contrast of the decision, the choice that Jesus made for you and for me, and the choice that Peter made. What we see in this beautiful garden experience is we see four different ways that choices are made. You can make a choice based on the flesh. You can make a choice based on the facts. You can make a choice based on um, the, the popular crowd whom you're going to follow. Or you can make a choice based on your faith, based on the Father, based on what you know of Jesus and who you know of Jesus to be. And if you ever wonder about that choice, you simply have to go back to chapter 14, verse 36, to see that Jesus made the choice for you. Friends, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus made his choice. He made a choice to choose for you. And he asked us the question, will you make a choice for him? That's the garden experience. Um, sorry for a little bit of a deviation from how we normally do this, but I just think the garden experience is way too important to not see this. Questions, thoughts, comments. Yeah, Nell, I think you're muted there. I was just thinking about when you talk about 
the facts? Yes. Well, I see that as two different things, facts of the time. Mm -hmm. And then when we come to the fourth, faith, there are facts of faith. Yes, no question. You go to the Bible and there are so many facts. Yes. The question that I'm asking here is, is your decision being made on fact only? Are you leaving faith out? Are you leaving the will of the Father out? Yeah, or is your yeah. decision uh, based on fact? I go only? with that. Be because many times fact is fact is is not is not necessarily truth. Great point hey. though. Great point. Other Mark? thoughts, other questions. Yes. Mark. Hey Jane. Yeah. I, I love the way you did a parallel with the olive press and Jesus being pressed three times. Everything, the name of Gethsemane, I've never heard any of that. I love that. It's just a beautiful picture. Amen. And I, I use I a lot the, of olive. <laughs> yeah, I had the privilege when I was over in Nazareth. Um, and we were, I was on a tour of the Holy Land and we went into Nazareth and actually went into a, a recreation of a Nazarene village. And they actually showed us what an olive press would have looked like. And they described that. And you you saw the the bags, they're kind of like burlap bags, and then this this long log that goes across of it with a weight on the end, and they press it three times so that the olives sweat and it comes out of the bags and into a basin underneath it. And he said they press them three times. It's and, and you know immediately you're going okay that's that's what this was. Jesus was pressed three times. Yeah, kind of brings that whole imagery to life. Other thoughts, questions? Well, Mark, I hate to be the one that talks, but also I was thinking about how often we fall asleep. <laughs> I'm thinking of times when I'm watching something and I want to see the end of it and a commercial comes and I fall asleep. I did not want to, but I had to do something to keep from doing that. Yes. So we have to be alert when we're tempted to sleep. Well, notice, and that's a great point. Notice what Jesus tells them. Watch, keep watch, and pray. There is, there's something in terms of doing that. And, I, you know, what he's basically telling us to do today is don't be asleep. And this goes beautifully hand in hand with what we saw in chapter 13, these are not the signs, stay alert. And he says that four times. Be alert, watch, keep alert. Look at look and see what's going on. So yeah, great point. Rosemary, you wanted to say something. Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Honestly, your teachings every day inspires me to, you know, want to be here. God bless you guys. It's Thank so you. good to fellowship with you. Um, yes, you really emphasize on, you know, the Three times things happen. Jesus prayed three times. The disciples fell asleep three times, and Peter denied um, Jesus and um, three times and stuff. So even in my life, I've seen how God is so gracious. You know, even when I I fall, you know, He keeps coming after me, and you know, so I don't know. There's something about you know three times in this story. It really cap captivated me. You know, but I have a question with regards to um, Judas. Yeah. Why did he have to kiss Jesus? Is it that he, they all, the disciples all looked alike? Or, you know, I've been always pondering on this question. Why no. the kiss? Is it that they didn't recognize Jesus without that kiss? Or, I don't know. No, remember, first of all, it's dark. Second of all, um, who's coming with Judas are the the guards, the the cohort that's being sent from both a combination of both the Roman leaders and the, the Jewish religious leaders. So what we get from the other gospel accounts is there could have been anywhere from 200 to 600 people that came to arrest Jesus in the garden. And it's both comprised of Jewish soldiers and Roman soldiers, as well as some people from the, from the town, from Jerusalem. So Judas goes up to make sure that they get the right guy. 
and he has already made it plain that the one that I kiss on the cheek will be the one that you arrest. So it is by that he identifies Jesus as the one to be arrested. But the irony of it is he could have just pointed at him and said, that's the one. And actually in the two other gospel accounts, Jesus says, it's here I am. It's me. Who, who are you seeking? Jesus and Nazareth. That's me. Uh, in in uh, John and in in uh, Luke, I think we get that very specifically that Jesus says, "I here I am." Um, but Judas does that. He, he does this this intimate kiss, which was how we were supposed to be as believers, how we we're supposed to be bonded together, how we're supposed to be intimate. Um, the symbol of us being together, and Judas uses that to betray him. And actually, Jesus says, "You would betray me with a kiss." Um, it's it's a very poignant situation. Um, Judas does it to make sure they they get the right guy. Um, um, so uh, hopefully that answered your question. Yes, it does. And one more question. Sure. Um, I was wondering with, with regards to Judas and the betrayer, because again, it's been it was a prophecy already, and so I'm, I'm always asking my question. If Judas didn't betray Jesus, how would the prophecy, you know, come to pass and stuff? Because that has always been like, you know, it was already prophesied. So did he just play into it or would be, you know, a different solution? Yeah, I, what you have to say is that God, who lives outside of space and time, knew it was going to happen. The prophecy was declared because he knew that's the way it was going to happen. Judas still had the opportunity to make the choice. And Jesus gives him through the upper room and the garden experience, Jesus gives him three different chances to be able to say no. God's not influencing him, but he knows it because he's already been there. He, living outside of space and time, God knows what was going to happen. The prophecy reflects what God knows is going to happen. But Jesus still says to Judas, still gives him three opportunities to say no but it fulfills the prophecy because it's going to happen. Um, so it's, it, it, you know, this is one of those things, Rosemary, that I think when you get to the kingdom one day, you're going to be able to say to God, how would that have happened? Um, I, I can't answer it other than to know God sovereignly knew. Judas fell into it, did exactly what he was supposed to do. It was shown. Um, the gospel writers foretell it going all the way back. Um, this, I mean, it's, it's exactly the way it should have should have happened. Um, and I, you know, it's an interesting thing. Thank you, Diane. That's a good statement. It's an interesting thing to know this. Maybe one of the reasons Judas didn't back down was there was a group of two hundred soldiers behind him. Uh, maybe when he gets to the garden and Jesus gives him the opportunity to say, "Don't do this." Um, that mob rule, that mob mentality may have just captured and taken Judas right with him. Because actually we know after the fact, when he finally sees him, Judas knows the guilt of having sentenced an innocent man to die by crucifixion. So uh, just an interesting interplay. Judas is an interesting guy. Um, I don't know that there was a well, I'll just leave it there. Judas is an interesting guy, so <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yes. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? I just realized so, today yeah. that it was this where we get the kiss of death from. <laughs> yes, that's right. This is the kiss of death. We have um, We have three sessions to go. We have chapter 15, which will now be the crucifixion. We have chapter 16, which is the resurrection. And we have the last couple of verses of chapter 16, which is the ascension. And we will spend time on that. So we have three left to go. We've already celebrated Easter, so it's really fun to kind of take a look back over what we've celebrated and see how Mark unfolds it. But we're now at the point, um, chapter 15, the crucifixion, uh, chapter 16, the resurrection, and then the latter part of chapter 16, the ascension. So we will tackle 
three really significant issues in in our history uh, and the history of the world those those three issues any other thoughts comments questions yeah. anything yeah yeah yes chris chris hey, has chris. something sure uh, hi there <laughs> the day wouldn't pass by without something from me. Um, <laughs> could you go back in um chapter uh, 14 uh, at the beginning about um during the feast of passover yes but they did not want to arrest him during the feast mm -hmm. Um, so the scenario and the timetable, I read somewhere that the uh, feast, the Passover was a three-day festival, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So they didn't want to arrest him during the feast. That was the Passover meal itself? Mm -hmm. Yes. So then the arrest came after so that timing? Well... Consider also, they're, they're picking their time and their spot. Part of that celebration of Passover happened publicly. Last thing they wanted to do is to arrest him in the synagogue. They don't want to do that. They don't want to arrest him in the temple. They don't want to arrest him in the courts. Because they're still, remember, they're just one week earlier, he's been heralded coming into town, triumphal entry. So they pick their spot. I think it's fascinating to note that part of the spot that is picked, Jesus takes the disciples to a place that the disciples knew very well. Judas would have known it very well because they had gone there on a number of occasions. So Jesus makes it very easy for them to come get him. Dark of night, after the meal, late at night, um, alone, just them in the garden. He makes it very easy for them to come actually capture him and take him. Um, but it's, you know, for it to happen during this time period um, is just the foreshadowing of him being our Passover lamb is just, it's just really significant. And there's a tremendous amount in Jewish culture that you just sit there and go over and over again. Wow. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that points to Jesus. That points to Jesus. That points to Jesus. Um, and this is just another one of those. So yes, um, in answer to your question, what they were not wanting to do, they didn't want to cause a riot because they were still concerned at this time that a riot might overturn what they're trying to do and that is to get Jesus killed. Um, so they picked their time and their place. Very calculated. Thank you. Sure. Any final thoughts, questions, comments, complaints? I don't think we'll ever look at this scripture again without mm -hmm. thinking of exactly what we learned today. And I, I, it's, it's just beautiful. It is beautiful imagery that just came to life. And they should have seen it. And I know I should see it more. And what so our choices Our mean. choices. Yeah. I'm, yeah. How important that is. Very. I never important. think about that. I don't either. Say, Let me leave you. I don't. Let me leave you with a, um, as we conclude here, I'm going to leave you with a little poem. I don't do this very often, but this is, this is a significant poem. A guy by the name of Paul Lytle wrote this. It's called, What Would I Have Done? Oh. What would I have done had I been there? Would I have helped his cross to bear? Would I have cried, O oh, set him free, release this man and take thou me? What would I have done had I been there? Would I offer comfort, aid, or care to him who left his heavenly throne to bear his rugged cross alone? What would I have done had I been there? Would I of his affliction share? Would I have stood before the crowd to save the Savior from his shroud? What would I have done had I been there? Would I have stood to scoff and stare? What would I have done? I cannot say. What matters is what I do today. Just puts an exclamation point to the whole discussion we've had here today 
and that is you see four distinct ways that decisions are made, a decision for Christ. And when you see ultimately that Christ made a decision for us, we kind of ask the question, how can we not make the decision for him? But be that said, we're human and we're going to see, you can go to chapter 21 and see chapter 21 of the book of John and see what Jesus does with Peter, who three times fell asleep and three times denied him. And yet Jesus still comes back to him and forgives him three times and gives him his charge. His charge to go feed my sheep, go take care of my sheep, go take care of the flock. Peter was so unworthy of that, but the gift of grace was so magnificent. And you see a transformed man in the person of Peter because of that forgiveness. Based on the choice, based on the choice from that point on, Peter chooses for Jesus every time. So um, as, we, as we stare at decisions in front of us, um, do we choose them on the basis of fact? Do we choose them on the basis of the flesh? Do we choose them on the basis of the mob rule, whom to follow? Or do we choose them on the basis of who died for us? The faith that we have in Christ. What matters is what I do today. The choices that I make today. Anything else? Diane, are you trying to say something? I'm yeah, but I guess I, there we am go. I muted? Okay, no, now you're it? back up. Yeah. Okay. I just, when you said that, I just got back to, when you said that, G, that Jesus called God Abba Father, and it was because it's a, because he was deeply known to Jesus. Mm. This is a, not a warning, but a sign to me, and I guess a bit of a warning, that if I'm not, deeply connected if i'm not abiding in him day by day my choices aren't going to be of the spirit so i mean already j just this morning because i've been praying for months years probably that i wouldn't be judgmental and this morning as i was getting ready to leave the house and i'd gotten a note from somebody in my family and I'm going, well, if they just hadn't been so stupid, blah, 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 you know, and I'm going, wait a minute, God, I don't want to be judgmental. Forgive me. I don't know their mind. I don't know their hearts. I don't know their circumstances. Only you do. So my job is not to judge them, but to love them. And if I hadn't been in the word, if I hadn't been connected to him so much, I would have just let that go. Yeah. So I just think that's a perfect example of deeply knowing, I mean, of Jesus deeply knowing the Father. And we can do that too. Mm -hmm. You know, that it, bye, it's, bye. A great, it's a great illustration, Diane. Um, what would happen if Jesus had not been deeply connected to the Father in the garden? He might have looked oh, at the wow. three disciples and said, you, you, you guys, <laughs> you can't stay awake for one minute. Why would I save you? Yeah, a bunch of losers. You guys. Yeah, yeah. But I mean that that you... judgment that judgment could have easily been Jesus on us, and yet he chose to go to the cross, yeah. even in the midst of. And, and understand, this is this is really significant. We miss this too many times. Let me get to the verse. We miss this too many times. Um, this is verse fifty of chapter fourteen. All this happens, he gets taken, he gets seized, then they all forsook him and fled. Yeah. Every single disciple ran away. As a matter of fact, <laughs> verse 51, now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young man, like, they laid hold of the young man, he left the linen cloth Mark. and fled from their naked. That scholarship says that that's Mark. Mark's telling a story yeah. on himself. Let me show you how much I fled. I fled to the point that they pulled my clothes off of me and I fled. <laughs> no. You know, I, I, think that's, I think that's Mark's Peter response, uh -huh. where Peter right. did all of this. My response was, I fled from him so fast. That this is like I ran right out of my shoes. I, I ran yeah. right out of my clothes. I fled from him so fast. 
Um, sure and is. we know, we know from the biblical account, John's the only one of the disciples that even hangs around. Sure. Thank goodness for the, for the women. Um, because mm -hmm. They're the ones that showed up except for John. Um, and can you imagine? But I mean, here's Jesus. Think, yeah, go ahead. Jesus knew the heart of Peter and he sure. deeply knew him. And that's why he forgave him oh. so much. Yeah. Well, I think that's also why Jesus calls him Cephas, calls him Peter, the rock. He knows mm -hmm. ultimately who Peter is going to become. Um, and by the way, Peter only becomes Peter because of what Peter does. <laughs> if, if Peter hadn't failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and been forgiven and forgiven and forgiven, Peter would not be the Peter that we know. Um, this incredible rock who, by the way, was crucified upside down. Um, you know, imagine, um, it, which, which is another great, it's just another great lesson from the scriptures of, what we have been through molds and shapes us and what peter does is he could have you know when That's when true. jesus comes when jesus comes back on the shores of the sea of galilee and forgives him three times peter could have been devastated by that and walked away from it but jesus says do you love me do you love me do you love me yes i do yes i do now i'm hurt by the fact that you've asked me this three times and then he gives him his charge he finally sees beyond and sees that he's being forgiven and he's been given a huge responsibility from Jesus. Go be Peter, go be the rock, go feed yes. my sheep, go, go serve me in this manner. And, and Peter does it beautifully, still humanly, but he does it beautifully. So, still, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mark. Any other great questions, great, great conversation. Any other thoughts? We'll wrap it up here. Um, yeah, we tackle, we tackle chapter 15 and the trials and the crucifixion itself next week. So, um, wow, big stuff. Let me pray for us and we'll be done. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the time in your word. Thank you for the constant reminder to us that in the Garden of Gethsemane, this little olive press the place where you were pressured three times, the place where you sweated, the place where you chose three different times perfectly, you chose for us. You said, not my will, but yours, Father, and in your mind's eye, we were there. Mm -hmm. So we thank you. We thank you beyond what words can express that you made a choice for us. And it's our prayer that we would, first and foremost in our decisions, make the choice for you. God, we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for his faithfulness to follow you, for his faithfulness to hold true to your will, because we're in the kingdom because of it. So on this day, we rejoice and we give you great thanks. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. You bet. Have a wonderful day.